she is going to be the big star. They grew up at a time when Michigan was before it kind of hit the economic skids. She grew up in a relatively affluent household. She identified really early on with uh, black culture. She would love dancing with Temptations and would dance with the little girls in her neighborhood. And she tells stories that, you know, they would beat her and beat her and beat her. But all she wanted to do was dance with them. And eventually they finally were like, all right, you know, you can do it. And you know, that's obviously a theme of persistence that, you know, that I think the one thing that, you know, no one can take away from Madonna, no matter how much you dislike her music, is you kind of have to respect her ambition. She was one of six children, she was a third of six, which is interesting because if you believe in anything about birth order, usually you think it's the oldest ones who are the high achievers, but she was a middle child, and maybe that had something to do with why she was so um, such an extrovert, and she sort of had to fight to get attention. The kind of Catholic upbringing she had meant that it was rather strict, with very enforced parameters, and there was a lot of religious symbolism in her life. You know, Madonna said she grew up surrounded by nuns and priests who were always over at the house. And of course, we see the influences of that later on in her career. The religion was never too far away uh, from her image, from her lyrical themes, and from her videos as well. You know, it got her in a lot of trouble too. There's a lot of um, Catholic imagery that showed up in very subversive ways in her later work, particularly, most famously, the Life of Prayer video that ended up almost getting banned and resulted in a controversial fallout with her Pepsi deal. sorts of Catholic imagery. She's making out with a black Jesus statue come to life. There's burning crosses. And in her fashion as well, like the crucifixes she'd wear. Um, you know, she definitely was kind of like the bad Catholic girl. To have that kind of schism, that young, you know, where you all of a sudden are forced to question and stop believing. And that's really one of the themes that runs throughout our music. It's like, do you believe? Do you not believe? Are you a virgin? Are you a whore? You know, what, what's right, you know, and what's bullshit? Madonna's rebellious nature really began from that point. What's interesting is probably a lot of people would be surprised to find out that Madonna was actually an A student, you know, because she has this rebellious side and, and uh, obviously when she went into it, like, people probably thought she was someone who was always cutting class and was sort of like a truant and Rizzo type of girl. They say that she wasn't the most charismatic person in the world, which is weird because, you know, you see Madonna now and you think of her as poised and confident and she does what she wants, but I think when you're 
teenager is not necessarily like that. And kind of all the things that people would say about her were, you know, she was she was a, she was a dancer. She got straight A's. You know, she went to the cheerleader dance team. But no one ever pegged her for stardom. amazing to think, just knowing what we know about Madonna, uh, that she actually played drums and guitar in, in that band. There's a really famous quote where he just goes to her and you're all naked ambition, no talent. And it goes again back to Andy Warhol, you know, he, he was talented, but like no one's ever like, Andy Warhol was a great painter, but he had big ideas, and he knew how to rock them in a pop format, and Madonna had the same thing. Eventually she decided to go out on her own and move away from sort of the rock and punk thing she was doing as a sort of like, you know, New York punk person and, and go into dance music and she connected with uh, Stephen Bray who was a fellow student of hers at University of Michigan and they went on to do a million hits, like big hits, like Into the Groove and Express Yourself, you know, he was one of her primary songwriters. favorite Madonna songs. It's really funny because I recently read that the video she did for that song cost $1,500. I'm like, it costs that much? It looks like it costs like $5. But it's great. It's just her. And she's not even really looking as sexy as she later did. Her hair is short. It's brown. She's dressed in sort of these clothes from like Newsies, like these baggy like earth tone clothes. And it's just her dancing with two people in the background as low budget as it can get. But it's like a totally compelling video. And the song is great. deep song it's not like a song that's going to bring about world peace but it's just like it's set the template that she is great at doing these upbeat let's throw caution to the wind let's not give a crap about tomorrow let's dance all night party songs it was like a perfect first single it wasn't one of her bigger singles i think you know some of the stuff on her first album some of the best stuff she ever did And now, Noam Tiandis is proud to present the world premiere of Sire Recording Artist, Madonna. Everybody, come on, dance and sing. That was like a legendary club where like, you know, LL Cool J was the elevator man, the Beastie Boys and Keith Haring are dishwashers. And it would go from eight to eight every night in, in New York. And she would just, you know, dance there and you know, she'd dance all the gay nightclubs. She was going out every night. She was seeing these, these cool girls and kind of able to steal her style a little bit. And she kind of was able to mold herself into the idea of the person that she wanted to be. Disco Diva record at a time where there really wasn't a whole lot of uh, disco music going around. And she managed to write songs that were commercial enough, co writing with good partners, uh, so that they stood out as songs as well as dance chart items.
first big hit single, and it did so well that it kind of launched her because she got on the hit TV show American Bandstand with Dick Clark, which was really afternoon appointment viewing on the weekends. And is she hot? This is Madonna! She got a little interview with Dick. We are a couple of weeks into the new year. What do you hope will happen, not only in 1984, but for the rest of your professional life? What are your dreams? What's left? Mm, to rule the world. <laughs> there you go. Ladies it was such an unusual thing to say, because at that time, nobody really knew who she was. She had one hit single to her name. But looking back on it, it's certainly, um, well, it's certainly interesting. And, 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 and it came true to some Madonna. degree. The first time I heard Madonna, was on radio, Top 40 radio, it was Holiday, and I'm gonna freely admit I thought she was black. I thought it was an R&B black artist. I think a lot of people thought that. They did not, when they later saw the image that she had, that she was blonde and Italian, people were surprised. Then Borderline came out, which is a, one of her best songs ever, and the song that broke her through. tied to image I always will associate all those early Madonna songs in my mind with the video and in that video I actually literally found a striped hat that my mom had and I found a bow and glued it on and put it on my head so I could have the hat Madonna had in that video Madonna's early pop songs like no matter like whether you hate Madonna now whether you are the biggest Madonna fan ever you kind of can't deny those songs because still to this day you know almost 30 years later you put on borderline girls will dance to it and at the end of the day like that's kind of the general barometer for pop music like if you can get girls to dance to it you will be popular there was just something about her that even now is what i think i liked about her from day one no one told her wear rubber bracelets or dress like this or roll around the floor or you know, I always felt everything about her image, the way she presented herself, the songs, whether she wrote them or not, the songs she recorded and chose to record, was 100% her. I always felt she was authentic. It was completely coming from her. I was like, I want to be this person. And I think a lot of little girls wanted to be her in a way that I don't think girls necessarily wanted to be Britney Spears or even Katy Perry. Like... Madonna just always seemed like just she came up from the streets and she turned into like the biggest pop star on the planet. It's like the ultimate rags to riches story. Right place, right time. Television wants movement. And Madonna is the first great female move in videos. They're not songs, they're mini epics because the videos are what ends up people remembering. Those are the things, and they're playing on MTV all the time. She would appeal to everybody. I mean, I, I remember going to parties when I was like eight or nine years old, and like the, every eight or nine year old girl would sing every Madonna song. And like in hindsight, you're like, oh my god, these songs are so like sexual. And like if I was a parent, I'd be freaking out. But kids don't even know that because all they know is that Madonna was like pretty and cool and danced well and had good songs. hit single for Madonna and in the video of course we see her in a, in Venice in a gondola having her in the like a virgin garb with all of those bangles and bracelets and crucifixes and frilly clothes would have looked pretty silly over 90 or 105 minutes but for four minutes it's charismatic. And all of those image changes that she went through were perfect for four minute films. It's a really ambivalent song. It's just that, like, this relationship makes me feel brand new and fresh. But Madonna, in her, I guess, her uh, ability to manipulate and be controversial. Uh, you know, use the imagery in her favor. Uh, just the use of the word virgin set people on edge. You know, obviously, 
obviously there was a total uproar. She knew what she was doing. She was a provocateur. And I think in America, you know, if you can provoke, if you can create headlines, you can create controversy, she knew that it would sell. She was able to tap into these things, and she's always said she loved the book Cat and Us with traditional uh, gender and cultural stereotypes, and that's sort of what really like Virgin is. A queen of music and motion, and every biker's dream guest writer, Madonna. It was the MTV performance that did it. The best, coolest, craziest VMA's performance of all time was when she performed at the very first one, opening the 1984 award. That was the game changer. That was when people really were like, oh my God, who is this girl? She is going to be the biggest star on the planet. is, you know, not just the definitive uh, moment for Madonna, but for MTV and for pop culture as well. Oh, 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 oh. She rolled around on the floor in her underwear. It's kind of weird, the way I'm talking about now, oh, she rolled around the floor in her underwear. It's like, so what? It sounds tame now because pop stars have done so much more since then. Lady Gaga, who's obviously one of her logical successors, but back then it was shocking. fearless like she was letting it all hang out literally i think at that point i think people realized actually no this girl is going to be around for a long time if she didn't have that kind of unerring belief in herself if she didn't have that ability to know what is a hit and what what would work then you know i'm sure it would have gone to somebody else and i think if you look at pop history you know it's it's really it's not necessarily who writes the best songs but who who gets the best songs and who knows what to do with them and knows how to market them and that's one thing that no one had to teach Madonna you know she was like a marketing genius from square one Material Girl is a song where Madonna, even more so than ever, really establishes control of her identity and her persona. renouncing her Catholic heritage. The material girl was Madonna kind of um, putting forth her credo of what she values and what's important in life. Because you'd be hard pressed to look at Madonna's personal life and, and financial decisions and not say that this is a very greedy woman who really enjoys amassing tremendous wealth. It was a subversive song just saying like, you know, it was the 80s where, you know, the me decade where people, you know, greed is good. And it was still, you know, for one thing, a major hit, but it gave a lot of people a lot to talk about. There was, you know, a lot more weight to it than what were typical pop stars at the time. The video for Material Girl is her, it's, the, it's ironic. It's she is being wooed by a Hollywood director who's trying to buy her with, you know, money and, and, and gifts and she doesn't want him, so he impersonates a poor person to get her. Whatever was the material girl then, it was meant meant to be ironic, but no one ever seems to understand my sense of irony, except possibly the French. You know, as life goes on you begin to understand and appreciate things that are not material. Um, still, I have to live in the physical world. And so, um, you know, when I said I am the material girl in when I sang that song in the early 80s, I was it was very always considered, you know, I considered it tongue in cheek. Crazy for you, my friend lost her virginity to crazy for you.
Not me, my friend. Madonna recorded Crazy for You in uh, 1985, and it was for a film that like no one remembers called Vision Quest, and that was notable because it was her second big single, but it was also because it was her first ballad. I don't think a lot of people, especially who knew her from the early hits like Holiday and Lucky Star, thought she'd ever go into ballads. I mean, let's face it, she's not Whitney Houston or Mariah Carey. She's not known for having great vocals compared to some of the other pop divas. But it did open the doors for her. I think it was a different Madonna than we expected. She wasn't this kind of pop uh, provocateur. Rather, she was singing this heartfelt ballad where this kind of unrequited love. There's something about her vocals, I think, that, that she was able to convey emotion. You know, she is an, you know, she might be capable of being one of the most unemotional people on the planet, but I think, like, you know, when it comes time to go into the vocal booth, she knows how to kind of get that kind of mixture of yearning or regret or sentiment, and she knows how to ring it out. And again, it just established her as someone, something more than just a one-trick pony, someone who could be versatile and have different types of music and different types of looks and was going to have a lasting career. Obviously, the logical extension is Madonna was the closest thing to a female prince. Let's make her a movie star. The Susan character was clearly a Madonna character. You know, she actually doesn't even have that huge a part in the movie, but when she's on the screen, she lights it up. She's just like so raw and so earthy and so sexual and just so real and like, you know, just like a girl that guys would lust after, but like a girl you might actually know from around the way. So different from her image now. I mean, the Madonna we know now would not be like blow drying her armpits or, you know, putting her feet up on it uh, on the chair while she like eats popcorn with her mouth open at the movie. She was just like not a very classy girl, but a very cool girl. And I will tell you that the idea of having an iconic leather jacket that you wear everywhere. I spent years trying to find the perfect leather jacket for me, and it completely came from the fact that it wasn't Fonzie. It was the fact that Madonna had this perfect jacket in that movie. For me, at least, and for a lot of girls um, who grew up with Madonna, it was so much about her style, and she just had the cool style. I like anything she wore, I bought, or I would go into my mom's closet and then cut up with scissors to make look like something Madonna wore. And in that movie, the defined early iconic Madonna style, the wayfarer glasses, the huge hair with the bow, the cool jacket, the layered tattered clothes, the, the idea that she just sort of like took her entire like suitcase and it vomited on her and here she is in all these layers of clothes and she looks amazing. It, it definitely came from that movie and it definitely established her as an icon. I think a fashion icon as well as just a all around star. It also produces the song Get Into the Groove, becomes another one of her huge hits. And it's kind of one of her last new wavy kind of freestyle kind of songs. But it's, you know, it's a catchy dance smash. <laughs> to, I guess, her disco background. It's not a disco song per se, but it's a song that, you know, it's about dancing, that's a dance song. So that always plays well, and it really tied into uh, the movie itself. It's another Stephen Bray collaboration. It's just like a perfect dance song. I mean, if I hear that anywhere, I will stop what I'm doing and dance to it. I'm not even exaggerating. To me, it's up there with some of the best, like, Michael Jackson songs like Rock With You and Don't Stop Till You Get Enough. It's it's not a song that's deep. It's a song about let's dance, but sometimes that's all you need is like the perfect Saturday Night Club song. in the nicest possible sense of the word, a freak show. 
their wedding was covered by helicopter. Now, oh, usually people are just worried about wedding crashers. You and me on the street, we get married, we don't want people to come in that we don't know. Wait a minute, we don't look to the skies. really I think from Madonna to her father you know the whole thing was about this young girl who'd sort of gotten herself in trouble sexually gotten pregnant and was having this argument with her dad about the fact that she didn't want to give the baby up or have an abortion she was going to keep her baby abortion is still a hot button topic uh, some people don't want to touch it. So just imagine what it was like in the mid 80s to have a song which message was, you know, I'm keeping my baby. And it got really mixed reactions. There were family groups that praised the song saying, OK, you know, Madonna is preaching, taking responsibility, you know, not having an abortion or giving up your baby for adoption. But if you get pregnant, doing the right thing and marrying your boyfriend and raising the baby. Other people said, no, this is glamorizing teen pregnancy. She couldn't win, you know? It's really just a Romeo and Juliet song, but she's able to kind of put it in the 80s context. She wasn't writing a, you know, a Janis Joplin kind of song. She's writing these songs that appeal to like American teenage girls. Donna dedicated the song to the Pope, uh, which, as you can imagine, caused all kinds of headlines around the world. Up until now, she'd kind of been less, perhaps not subtly, but taking digs at them with like a virgin and some of her Catholic iconography. But this was kind of an open, all-out declaration of war. And the video, she was very toned. She had a different look. She cut off her hair, and it was very short and blonde, and she looked very sophisticated. Uh, sort of that boy toy look that she had before it was going away. It was sort of the first time we really saw Madonna have one of her million persona changes and body changes. Madonna's wearing this very provocative black bustier and kind of bouncing around quite a bit in this sexy outfit. I was told that this is when Guy Ritchie actually started to develop a bit of a crush on Madonna. And he used to watch this video again and again and again, uh, saying, you know, God, she's so hot. So ironically, he later ended up marrying her, but it was in that music video that he first, I think, started to kind of really fancy her. Desperately Seeking Susan was a hit. It gave us the number one song into the group. You would have thought, wow, a film career awaits. No, it does. Shanghai Surprise, I would say that's Madonna's first lead movie, and um, that generally was not received very well. You know, a lot of people wanted to do whatever they could to bring Madonna down. You know, the fact that Shanghai Surprise was not a good movie at all allowed people to just kind of take their shots at Madonna. And then... A New York Times film critic, Vincent Canby, wrote the nail on the head piece, which was, Madonna has already made her great films, and they are all four minutes long. together with Sean Penn, I didn't think it was forever, because we already know that she'd been through a number of men on the rise to the top. Sean was incredibly aggressive and violent at that point in his life. Madonna has actually admitted, or it's been reported, that he tied her up at one point, uh, you know, threatened her with a baseball bat. There have been all kinds of unsubstantiated rumors that he hit her, um, that he was violent in the relationship. It was a very ugly uh, relationship at points and I think Madonna who you know loves to provoke loves to probably fight in her personal relationship was like a, a match to a flame 
and when it came to Sean Penn, who had a very much an out-of-control temper. starting to become absorbed in the mainstream but like a prayer ends up having this kind of interracial video and there's like burning crosses in the south and there's like ideas of the most planned like i said she's a provocateur you know if there was any taboo no matter what the taboo was she would have tried to break it whether it was right or wrong it was so shocking to a lot of people that Pepsi got shell shocked and wanted to cancel the contract and like she never had anyone feeling too comfortable. And I think as her career has progressed, I think that's been the problem of why she's she's had trouble kind of being this figure, you know, like at a certain point, like you break every single taboo, like there's not there's nothing left to shock. For the first 15 years of her career, there was nobody that could bottle up that combination of these different themes of like sex and lust and rebellion and you know racial mixing and all these different things that were kind of like simmering in America, and she'd kind of put them out in the light. And obviously, like you know, there was political things going on beneath it, but no one had ever dealt with it in a pop form. You couldn't ignore it. She was able to make you never be able to turn your head away because even if it was a car crash, you'd kind of want to see what. <laughs> job which you know for the most part was kind of a kind of a disaster in a lot of ways it was sort of the beginning of a very weird multi uh, media time for Madonna Stars taking underground trends or things that are sort of bubbling under and turning them into the mainstream, and Vogue was one of the best examples of that. Voguing came out of the 1960s Harlem ballroom dance scene, mostly underground, mostly gay uh, community, and she turned it into one of the biggest pop songs in 1989 or 1990, and you know, made doing this sort of like a thing that like your grandma would do even though she has no idea where it comes from don't just stand there let's get to it strike a pose there's nothing to it you know everyone knew it was eight years after the fact that vogue had kind of had its popularity but you know i don't think the average you know person in middle america knew what voguing was until madonna did it it was a perfect example of her with her ear picking up a frequency that most people weren't hearing and making it her own and it was also an, another continuation in terms of the video of her more glamorous, more classy look, the sort of Marilyn Monroe things she started to do, getting away more and more from the kind of crassly slutty look that she had uh, established with her early albums. They had a very strong black and white video, very highly stylized, and you know one of the best uh, meetings of 
uh, message and music in Madonna's career. Not only does she tie it in with these these themes of you know gay liberation, which are all kind of sublimated. You know, she's named after Ginger Rogers, Fred Astaire, you know all these American icons. On the cover of a magazine. She's bringing all these different ideas together with kind of a subversive idea beneath it, and then you know she's got a catchy video. And the truth of the matter is, you know, whether or not you know what voguing is, it's, it kind of comes down to the fact that everyone remembers Madonna for being the person who vogued because it's not necessarily who does it first, it's always kind of who does it best. What may have been her live peak was the Vogue tour. And, and she was just so hot that the heat of her career was in itself sexy. But she had a sense for packaging each song in a production album. That was perfect for the song itself. And then they moved to the stage, and they do something else, and, and you couldn't take your eyes off. Madonna will always have the sexiest dancers, the newest fashions, and she'll take credit for them. Not because she's being arrogant, but because everybody will give her credit for it. Because they don't know who that second beautiful dancer from the left is. Let's just say it's a Madonna show. Madonna! I just think life is unfair. Like, here I am, this person, everybody thinks I have everything I want, right? But I want you and I can't have you. It was the Truth or Dare movie where it was one of the first times where she went to her mother's, her mother's grave, you know, since she was a little girl. And if you really want to mark Madonna's career up into paths or into, you know, spheres, 1991 is kind of where she makes the sharp break. You know, she released the Immaculate Collection that year. And I think you could probably make a case that that was when she finally had gotten maybe the first bit of degree um, of peace with you know her mother's passing. I never really understood why she was taken away from us. It just seemed so unfair. I never thought that she had done something wrong. So oftentimes, I'd wonder what I'd done wrong. She never wants to leave. She never wants to live any of her life with the cameras off. If it was ideal, she'd have the cameras on at all times. And they talk about her early shows. You know, she was one of the first ones to realize that she was like she would let the audience be the peeping tom. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I don't a, like her. I don't either. Believe me, it's sickening. I don't like any of the people I sleep with either, so what difference well, does it make? Well, that's why I sleep with them, because they're hideous. <laughs> it's very interesting that Madonna didn't get more of a reputation for being bisexual. She famously hung out with Sandra Bernhardt as a gal pal. But that's because she went through so many people that inevitably a couple of them were going to be women. <laughs> Let's make a $150 coffee table book 
of explicit photos. I mean, nobody said that to any pop star ever. Can you imagine anybody saying that to Barbara Streisand? To me, I was like, what are you doing? Like, it's one thing to be sexual in your videos, to be sexual in your song lyrics, but when you're actually doing a softcore porn book where you're posing naked with vanilla ice, with vanilla ice and Big Daddy Kane and Naomi Campbell. I'm proud to buy it. <laughs> I'm not ashamed. Once again, you have to realize this was 1991, let's say. Uh, people were more easily shocked than they were now. The sense of how far she could take it, because this could have potentially been a career end. And then she knew intuitively when to cut it. And she let the book go out of print. It came out and coincided with what I think is one of her weaker albums, Erotica, which I think, which again was just so hammering you over the head with the sex thing. And there was just something about it that I thought seemed very desperate and very, um, yeah, just trying too hard and silly and just trying to shock, like, ooh, look how shocking I am. Madonna had said numerous times she wanted to have a baby with a Latin man, Puerto Rican particularly, because she thought they would make beautiful babies together. going to go down history as being a great actress, but occasionally she gets married to the right part, and the reason why Desperately Seeking Susan worked well for her was because she was basically playing a variation of herself, and some people could say with Evita she sort of was too, this very um, ambitious woman who came from nothing, who is determined to make something of herself. Some would say, you know, Madonna has used men or used her feminine wiles to get ahead. Evita was the great musical hit on stage of the late 70s. And for some reason, the film didn't get made, even though an entire generation of star females were mentioned for the part and seriously considered. In the film, she plays Evita Peron, the wife of Juan Peron, leader of Argentina. And this is a role that she'd always kind of wanted. And obviously she found, I'm sure, tons of emotional connection with a woman that kind of got everything that she wanted. I was extremely passionate about it. I knew that it was a chance for me as an actress and a singer to do things I had never done before and to push myself and to grow. It won't be easy. You'll think it's strange. Doing Don't Cry from the Argentina from the balcony in the uh, Casa Rosada. Uh, she was charismatic. Don't cry for me, Argentina. That was her first big film success, kind of her only major, major film success, but I think it proved that she was able to have that kind of, she was able to have that versatility and she was able to kind of get in the mind of a very, very powerful woman who would stop at nothing to succeed. So obviously a huge stretch. I think it's an incredible role for any actress to play. And I felt that I could completely understand her compassion and uh, her ambition and all the things that she experienced. I love you and hope you love me. I just feel that what's happening to me is a perfect example that, that uh, of um, you know if you if you just keep on going and you put your mind to something, you can achieve anything. Please look at me to know that every word.
so much a pop album as it was an attempt to kind of negotiate with you know the electronic music that was going on at the time. You know, for most people in the music industry, electronica, that catch all was seen as the next big thing. <laughs> You know, and, and she's somebody who really, you know, as even dance music continues to thrive in 2012, it's probably the biggest it's ever been. You know, Madonna was the first one. She was the one that kind of was able to do it in a way with more style than anybody had and more visual flair. She was the first one to get that it wasn't enough to just be a good singer, not to have good songs. You had to be an icon. You had to, if you wanted to survive, you had to you know, become not just a, a conversation at the dinner table, but you had to become a conversation at the dinner table. Well, yeah, well, I have been in the, I've been in the music business 16 years. This is my first Grammy, and, uh, well, actually, I've won four tonight, but... <laughs> you know, worth the wait and all that. I want to know if I was difficult to work with. No, it was great. there so much, I work there so much, I can't stand staying in hotels, and, you know, so it would be kind of like a second home, I don't think it would be my primary home. We need dialogue. Invented herself as this English rose writing a children's book, you know, talking about baking bread and staying at home wearing these like day dresses. It's absolutely ludicrous. The problem with the English roses was that they were all a little bit jealous of a little girl in the neighborhood. I tried out all the stories on my children, and whenever they got bored and started fidgeting or, you know, complaining or looking for other things to do, I knew I had to fix that kind of thing. It's like Madonna thinks that the rest of us have such short memories that nobody remembers the whole S&M stuff from before and we're happily ready to accept her as this, you know, English rose. Now, of course, what we see more recently is another reinvention, kind of something in the middle. She still wants to be sexy, she wants to prove that she can be 53 and she can rock a bodysuit, but at the same time, uh, she's not quite as seedy and naked as she used to be. I think Kabbalah has played a large role in some of the uh, images we've seen of Madonna as she's kind of dabbled at, at one time very, very deeply involved in the revolution. I think lately perhaps a bit less so. Um, we've seen the kind of influences of, of having a spiritual life and how that has affected her in terms of her public image. Um, but there's this one little problem and that is that I have a lot of concerts I have to do. So my, my throat is a bit sore, and I'm supposed to actually not be talking very much because I have a concert tomorrow. So Lola has volunteered to read the story to you. <laughs> Once upon a time, that rose before him in the sea. She had a couple of huge flops. American Life was, you know, first and foremost, you know, the biggest flop of them all. You know, that's the song where she tries to rap, um, and it went about as well as you might imagine. I'm drinking a salate. I get a double shot. It goes through my body, and you know I'm satisfied. Dance Floor from 2005 was probably, in my opinion, the last great Madonna record. We'll see how the new one is, but that was, I think, her last real great record. And it, in a way, it was a, a full circle achievement. American Life had been, you know, kind of a misstep of her trying to be all political. And she got back to, actually, 
what she did in the beginning, her dance roots, her dance interior roots. Her last great single was Hung Up, which sampled Gimme, Gimme, Gimme a Man After Midnight by ABBA, brilliantly sampled that. point she had kind of gotten a reputation as being very very self-serious um and confessions on a dance floor tried you know, it was designed to be similar to a dj mix and hung up uh was one of her biggest hits in a long time Plus countries, which made it the most widespread number one single uh, in pop history. was the way that they fought was very much the way like 14 year old boys would fight like no you're stupid no you're stupid it was the most adolescent dynamic i have ever seen in a relationship in my life i think what what drew madonna to guy was you know like a lot of strong women she was looking for someone who was her equal who matched her who wasn't intimidated by her and i think guys very english upbringing allowed him to be very reserved and certainly not to show visibly that he thought she was cool or impressive. Madonna was really drawn to that. I think Guy mirrored a lot of her own father's uh, demeanor and behavior in the sense that he was cold, he was remote, he didn't give praise easily. Madonna was very attracted to that, but later, of course, I think she felt very hurt by the fact that he wasn't more supportive or more complimentary of her efforts. <laughs> my sister's husband, and I have no intention of getting in between that. Um, as far as him being a wedge between us, his insecurities led him to behave a certain way with me. You know, we were very close, her and I, and he, it was, that was not an easy thing for him. Um, is he homophobic? Probably. Uh, but I think the combination of what I was to my sister connected with the way that I have sex is, was difficult for him to deal with. And, you know, it was, as Rupert Everett said, sort of, you know, me or him. How does it feel to be back in Malawi, Madonna? Amazing. Can you tell us why you're adopting again, Madonna? No. Madonna was always a very active mother and a very uh, strong mother but then I think as she went through her divorce from Guy Ritchie she began to depend more and more on her then I think 12 or 13 year old daughter their relationship now definitely resembles more uh, two girlfriends than it does mother and daughter and if you look at 
Lola's life. She's growing up so fast. She has a clothing range, a clothing line. She had a cameo in her mother's movie Pretty. She's been in Madonna's music video. She clearly, she's at a performing arts school. She clearly wants to be a performer. And it looks like Madonna is almost morphing from this performer herself into probably the stage mother from hell. Um, but she's getting to kind of vicariously, I think, relive some things through Lorna. just the whole adoption period, you know, going through the bureaucracy of it and everything is exhausting. And then, you know, to have to, to you know, go there and see that, you know, the palpable suffering of the children and and to feel like you were doing something good and then to come home to everyone screaming and outraged and ki accusing you of kidnapping and, and all the, you know, it, it hurt, I have to say, but, but, you know, time has gone by and I can look back at it and say, well, you know, people didn't understand, and often people jump to conclusions when they're not educated and they don't know what's going on. And um, I knew eventually that people would understand the story, and um, you know, obviously I had to go through that as well. So it all worked out okay in the end. How does it feel to be back in Malawi, Madonna? Amazing. <laughs> artistic direction exactly basically like direct. she's making a yeah. music video it looks good but everything else the script uh, how the movie flows there's a lot of uh, anachronistic stuff or stuff from out of time you know you've got wallace simpson dancing to some punk song from the cure stuff like that that madonna thought was very edgy has been universally reviled by critics live performer she is fantastic i had the privilege of going to a very small concert she held and i was in a, in a vip area standing next to guy ritchie and we were very close to the stage and um at the time uh she was fantastic a lot of energy she really commands the room in fact she reminded me of oprah winfrey in a strange way because i've i've been in a situation with oprah as well and she just has to stand there and say anything banal and the whole audience is riveted madonna has that same commanding presence they remind me of each other. And she just had the audience in the palm of her hand from the minute she came on stage. performance at the Super Bowl was a great spectacle. It was a great show, which is what Madonna is famous for. If you looked at the way the stage was lit and all kinds of, you know, amazing graphics and visuals and dancers and choreography, it was very well done. There was, for example, this man on a tightrope 
there's a particular name for what he did, and he's the first person to get national television doing that because she was clever enough to spot, hmm, this is new, get him to do this tightrope thing. Hands up. <laughs> was of a different ethnicity, so that would expand the audience, as Nicki Minaj did. And she knew she was controversial, because uh, that's how Maya became famous in the United States, was through her controversy. Should Nicki Minaj, should M.I.A. there? Those are her hand-picked kind of children, you know, it was kind of a slap in the face. I think, I think Lady Gaga, and I'm sure Katy Perry would have killed to have had that, but it's interesting that Madonna picked Nicki Minaj and MIA, and I think if you really want to study her career, that's not surprising at all because she identified all the th stuff that she was taking was from African American, you know, Caribbean culture. She was taking all these different things, and you know, you have somebody like MIA who's who's originally from Sri Lanka, and her dad was a Tamil Tiger. She was a she was a rebel, and she's flicking off the camera. You know, whether that was planned or not. You have Nicki Minaj, who's from Queens. She's a rapper. She's a girl. And, and she's still stealing everything. From, I mean, everyone steals everything from Madonna. If you saw Nicki Minaj's recent Grammy performance, you know, she's going against a Catholic church. And the funny thing about it was everyone, you know, there was a priest there, and she's playing on all these different themes, and she's going wild, and she's doing these sexual things, and you're supposed to be like, oh, my God, that's so awful. But it's not awful because, like, everyone saw that 20 years ago. MIA, you know, gave the middle finger. It really irritated Madonna. And, you know, she said she felt it was unnecessary, the energy had been so positive. But let's be honest, that's not the reason. The reason it irritated Madonna is that people were talking about that obscene gesture the next day instead of Madonna's performance. If anybody's going to shock, if anybody's going to provoke, it has to be her. If you looked at her alone, uh, the voice, some of the dance moves, the fact that she was actually holding cheerleading pom-poms at one point um, was a little bit silly. I think there is a fine line between being an older woman and being a fantastically sexy performer and looking ridiculous. And I think at points, she carried it off, you know, when she came in as the gladiator. And then at other points, when she was a cheerleader, it did look a little bit silly. Nonetheless, it put her single into the top 10 for the first week. Yeah. First of all, the title MDNA is amazing. It's a very clever title, and it also gives a nod to rave culture and shows that she's, again, going in the dancey direction. And Give Me All Your Lovin' is the new single. Uh, it has M.I.A. and Nicki Minaj. I see you coming and I don't want to know your name. You be Madonna. Madonna's very good about surrounding herself with people that are young and cool and will get her attention. She's done duets with Justin Timberlake, Britney Spears, people like that. It was a way for her to just kind of reestablish, like, hey, um, I am still, you know, the queen of all this stuff. You name a big male star of the late 20th century, and Madonna probably had some affiliation with him in some way, and if not, he wanted it, you know, because she took men like trophies. When you meet Madonna, the first thing that strikes you and kind of shocks you is how little she is. You know, she has this larger than life persona and this huge iconic reputation. And so when you see this woman who's barely five foot four, this tiny little figure, you, you find it hard to believe that so much power came out of such a small being. Madonna is 
not particularly warm or friendly. There's a there's kind of a frostiness about her, and you have to work for it, you know, to, to get her approval. She's notoriously hard on people. She expects her staff to be uh, available to her at all hours, day or night, for whatever she needs or desires. Additionally, she expects them to be in good shape. She expects everyone to take care of themselves um, or else. But at the same time, I don't think her standards are any less for herself than they are on other people. She's a classic perfectionist, and she demands that kind of stuff from everyone around her. Another thing about Madonna was she was like never into drugs. She never really drank. She would drink a ginger ale, and I think people thought she was weird. I think it probably strikes back to the fact that she never wanted to be out of control. She never wanted to, to feel weak or, you know, imperiled. And when you drink or you smoke, it's, you know, it's to lose yourself. And I think the, the story of Madonna is somebody who loves herself. I know someone who had a meeting with Madonna not too long ago, and she arrived in her pajamas. She just doesn't care. Another thing about Madonna is uh, a lot of people don't realize all her friends and family, they never call her Madonna. It's always M. So it'll be like, well, where's M? What time is M getting home? Are you at M's house? It's kind of her uh, personal nickname. Madonna actually doesn't really like the Madge uh, nickname. That came from the British tabloids, Her Majesty. I've been told she actually hates it. I'm quite positive that although she's called that frequently in the press, nobody would dare to call her that to her face. People have been wondering what the future holds for Madonna forever. I remember when she turned 30, people were like, how long can she keep doing this? When she turned 40, it was like, come on, you're already 40, can she still keep doing this? Now 50's behind her, she's 53 years old, and she's about to release another album, and she already has a song that's a top 40 song, and she's collaborating with Nicki Minaj. What does the future hold for Madonna? I don't think she's ever gonna stop. At the end of the day, you know, I love fancy clothes and sparkling diamonds and parties and dressing up and you know, all of those things, but I don't need them to be happy, and I never did. You will never stop trying to be the best. You will never stop uh, trying to stay on top. Her ambition apparently knows no bounds. I don't see Madonna ever stopping until nobody wants to go see her anymore. You know, her tickets, very controversially for her new tour, something like $300. And when she was asked, you know, how do you justify in this economy, you know, asking this kind of price, and she said simply, I'm worth it. And I think as long as she has that kind of confidence, that kind of self-belief, and that kind of, you know, incredible ability to captivate a room, she's going to keep going. Thank you.